will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. What is your expectation of what God will do in your life? Help me every day. Well, that's great. If we're going to take what Jesus says there, as he says it, then we can expect great things. Because he's a great God and because he's said so. Are our expectations of God in line with what he says in the Bible? Or do we, like Beth is, I think, in tune with the Holy Spirit, confess, are we just putting him in a little box, which isn't even a scriptural box? It's just a little one that we've devised of ourselves. Now, um, thank you, Sheila Weldon. Uh, on the screen again, um, next slide, you're going to see some molten hot rock. And I wonder who can tell me the difference between magma and lava. What is the difference between the two? That's not the difference. Anybody else? And they're both rock. Uh, not quite. It's closer. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. I'll put you out of your misery. So, magma is molten rock that is underneath the Earth's surface. Lava is when it erupts out. Yeah, so like when it comes from a volcano or something. That's lava. Now, I've, I've had us think about this because you perhaps remember back to your science classes or something you've seen on telly. The earth is made of different layers, isn't it? And, you know, we just think it's soil. But actually underneath there is red hot molten rock. <laughs> think of all the heat and all the power that is beneath our feet. Yeah, yeah, maybe. It keeps us warm. <laughs> it certainly would if we dipped our toes in it. There's so much power there, but it's concealed, isn't it? It's kept under the surface. But we're reminded of the forces of nature when, you know, you have a volcano go off. And then all of a sudden, you're reminded, whoa, okay. (laughs) There's so much power there contained, perhaps not visible to us normally, but it's there. And today, we're going to consider the gift of miracles. And I think that's a little bit what a miracle is like. It's like an eruption of power. It's not that God is any different, you know, the the magma has always been there, but when it erupts out, we're reminded, wow, there is power here. And a miracle is a display of God's power that's otherwise unseen. So we're going to think about what 1 Corinthians 12 describes as a gift of miracles. And um, truth be told, we'll only focus in on that towards the end of the message because I think we need to establish a couple of things first. And they are these. Does God work miracles? And does God work miracles today? And then we're going to think about this gift. And you can probably already imagine how I'm going to answer those questions, (laughs) but it's helpful for us to consider them before we come to this particular gift of the Spirit. So, what I want us to see first is that God works miracles. It's in his nature. He's God. He's not just a human 2.0. He's God. He's totally other and distinct from us. Now, a miracle, um, this is a little bit of a definition I've put together, which I'll explain for us because it's got some Greek words, but it's an event or occurrence that displays divine power. You know, we thought about magma, haven't we, and lava. Displaying power that's there. One of the words that's used for miracles in the Bible is on the screen, or will be, and it's uh, dunamis, so power, from which we get the word dynamite. So a miracle is an event or occurrence that displays divine power. It makes us go, wow. And it points us to God. I said makes us go, wow, because one of the other words that's used for miracles is wonders. You've come across that in the Bible, haven't you? You know, wonders. A wonder is something that makes you wonder. 
And a miracle points us to God because one of the words that's also used is what? Signs. So a miracle displays God's power, makes us go wow, and points us to God. If I was to ask you to put up your hands, do you believe in miracles? I think we'd all raise our hands, probably. But sometimes in our practice, we don't, do we? So, for example, someone comes to you and they say, um, Joe, I've got a cold, will you pray for me? And Joe says, of course. And then um, someone comes to Matt and says, Matt, I've got cancer. (laughs) Now, the sort of prayer that I might pray for a cold and for cancer would probably be quite different. You know, I might say, Lord, heal this cold, please. Amen. But if somebody said, oh, I've got leukemia, I might be... Oh, Lord, thou create, you know, do a really heavy-duty prayer. Because I perceive that, ooh, fixing a cold is, you know, that's doable. But fixing cancer, that's something completely different. But really, if God is limitless in power, a cold and a cancer are just equally fixable to him, aren't they? Now, some people say that when we read about miracles in the Bible, um, we can't really believe that. It's just a bit of mythology. So it was an uneducated people before a scientific age who were trying to explain something that they couldn't understand. And so it was called a miracle. Now, I think people who say that probably do a discredit to ancient people (laughs) who were able to create structures that have lasted for thousands of years who might not have had test tubes, but weren't thick. Miracles are not just exaggerations in the Bible. The Bible is a book of history. We might not understand it all, but it explains what happened. And, do you know, friends, if you can believe the first sentence of the Bible, then all the miracles that follow should be no problem. Because what is the first sentence of the Bible, church? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If God could do that by a word, which surely is a greater miracle than any other person claims to be able to do, anything else is a try for him. God created the heavens and the earth. Surely he can steer around the laws of nature that he's created and work a miracle. The Christian faith that we hold to is based on miracles, isn't it? Our Old Testament is packed full of miracles. Think about the Exodus, how God delivered his people through miracles. Our faith in the Lord Jesus is founded on a wonderful miracle, the resurrection, isn't it? And you know, if Jesus either didn't really die and kind of woke up again, or if Jesus really did die but his resurrection was kind of just spiritual... We're wasting our time. Only if Jesus physically died and physically bodily rose again does the Christian faith make any sense and have any power. Our God does work miracles, and our faith is based on miracles. And it's only a faulty concept of God that causes us to try and explain away miracles in the Bible. So have you ever heard somebody, put your hand up if you've heard somebody say, when um, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, it wasn't actually the Red Sea, it was the Sea of Reeds. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Okay, so um, some scholars say um, it was the Sea of Reeds. Now, the Sea of Reeds is only about two feet thick, and when a wind blows, it might sometimes dry up so you could go through. And that's a way that people try and explain away miracles in the Bible, for example. However, It would also be a miracle for all of Pharaoh's army to drown in two feet of water, which the Bible also says. We can't explain away miracles in the Bible. God is a miracle-working God. When does God work miracles? Well, he does so when there's a need. And I want us to turn back into the Old Testament, if you would, to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 35. 
Now, you remember, um, or pr perhaps you remember from reading the Bible, that um, the people of e Israel came out of Egypt through you know, miracles, but then they got into the desert, which isn't the most hospitable for living. There wasn't much food. There was precious little water, and they grumbled, didn't they? Now, what did God send to feed them? He sent manna, which means, what the heck is this? <laughs> Little bits of bread that, that fell on the floor. God sent manna to feed them. But what we read in Exodus 16, verse 35, is this. The people of Israel ate the manna for 40 years until they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of Canaan. God worked a miracle for them as it was needed, but then when the means was provided for them to feed themselves, they came to a place where they could plant crops and harvest them and bake their own bread, then the miracle ceased. It stopped at that point. God works miracles when there's a need. So, you know, if you've got a grand in the bank and you've got a bill comes in, you don't really need a miracle, do you? You know, you, you pay off your, your gas with your thousand pound in the bank. But when you're in minus 50 pounds in your overdraft and then a pressing need comes in, maybe that might be the time that the Lord would work a miracle. We need it, don't we? We haven't got the resources in ourselves. When does God work miracles? When there's a need. And as part of that, God doesn't work miracles for the sake of just our curiosity. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. In verse 38. Matthew 12 and verse 38. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Do us some trick, Jesus. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. God doesn't just do miracles for a trick to satisfy our idle curiosity. God might work a miracle where there's a need, such as um, Israel in the desert. When does God work miracles? When there's a need, and perhaps when we are ready. Miracles, they're a sovereign act of God, aren't they? They're his choice. I can't demand God to, you know, do anything. However, our faith is still involved in some way, and I don't understand quite how it works, but this is what the Bible says. So turn over to Mark chapter 6, would you please? Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 and verse 5. which speaks to Jesus, saying that he could do no mighty work there in Nazareth except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus was hindered from performing a miracle because the people didn't have faith. Now, I don't know how these two things quite work together. I haven't nailed it down in my head. God is sovereign, however, he still calls us to have faith. And so, when does God work a miracle? Perhaps when we are ready to receive one. So, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, um, Jesus said, um, When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be my witnesses. The word for power is one of those words that we've already seen already. It's uh, dunamis, you know, dynamite, power. Remember, that's related to one of the words for miracles. It's the same word, but in plural, that's used in 1 Corinthians 12, where it says, to some he gives gifts of working of miracles. Now, I've drawn the correlation to say this. Let us be filled with the Spirit. Let us keep in step with him. It's up to God if and when he was to work a miracle, but our responsibility is to be ready. 
When does God work miracles? When there's a need? When we're ready? And at the end of the day, when it's his will. So think about this. Uh, who were some people who were sprung from jail in the Bible? Peter? Yeah. When they were praying and then he was knocking on the door and they thought it was his ghost. Anyone else? Paul? Yeah. And Silas. So both together having a time of worship and praise in the prison. And then the, the chains fell off. But you know, those who were sprung from jail by a miracle, that was amazing. But there were some who were not and who were executed. So, for example, um, Stephen was stoned to death and James was put to death by the sword. Now, I imagine people prayed for both of these groups of people. However, it was up to God whether he was to work something miraculous or not. And we leave that down to God's sovereign wisdom, don't we? And maybe in your life, you've seen somebody in a similar situation to you, they've prayed, and something miraculous has happened, and everything has worked out in your eyes, fine. You might find that that won't happen for you. But God knows what he's doing. I imagine that the reward for someone like Stephen and James is equal to someone like Paul or Peter or Silas. God had something different prepared for them. God may give healing to you or he may not give healing to you. But we leave that with the wisdom of God. And knowing that whatever he does, he does in love as a father for us and he knows what's best. So when does God work miracles? When there's a need? When we're ready? Excuse me. And when it's his will. But I suppose a question is, do we need this? Do we really need miracles? Do we need supernatural power? Um, you know, the church is, well, courtesy of Matt being the pastor, this church isn't particularly organized, but the, the church is, is organized, you know, it, it knows, knows what it's doing, it's got the Bible, um, you know, we have all these means of communicating the gospel, etc., etc. Do we need supernatural power? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we do. Because the world is getting darker, isn't it? And because Satan doesn't, he uses all the means that he has, doesn't he? Think about this. If signs, wonders, and miracles were essential in the time when the Son of God was walking the earth, how much more essential are they now in his absence? You know, sometimes we might say, you know, now we have the Bible, and I hope you know that I love the Bible. <laughs> but, you know, if, if at the time of Jesus we need miracles, how can we say that now we have the Bible? We don't. <laughs> we do. We do. And what I want to say is this, and for some of us, this might not sit that easily with us. God works miracles, but God works miracles today. Now, I'm saying this because as we've been going through this, gift, this series of spiritual gifts, we've dealt with some that are kind of, you know, okay, mercy, helps, etc., government. But we're going to come to some of the list that make people squirm a little bit. Some that are overtly supernatural and miraculous. <laughs> and so what we're going to look at for a few minutes is a little bit of theology to think, does God work miracles today? And so thank you for that. That's, that's great, Sheila. Um, I'm going to throw up a verse on this, uh, a word on the screen, and it's the word cessationism. Now, put your hand up if you've heard of that word before. Okay, well, not most people, but not everybody. So, to define this this belief, it's to say this: that certain of the more overtly supernatural spiritual gifts, 
ceased to be given by God to the church sometime in the late first century AD. So when the last apostle died, God no longer gave certain spiritual gifts. That's the belief of cessationism. Some things have ceased, cess, ceased. They've stopped being given. Now, a little bit of my story. Um, I was saved when I went to Milton Baptist Church, um, as was G. And um, the Bible course that I did was taught with this, this belief that's on the screen. Um, and those who hold to this, that you know, certain gifts aren't given today, are faithful, godly people. And have good motives for believing it, but I don't think that they're right. So some of the motives that are given for explaining why we don't need particular miraculous things in the church today are these. And I think the most important reason that's given is reverence for the Bible. Reverence for the completed word of God. That what God has said to the whole church, you know, you're never going to come to a point in time when God's going to say, actually, I've got an appendix to add to the Bible. There's, you know, there's a real reverence for the word of God in those who hold this view. And those who hold this view would say, for example, miracles and signs were given only to authenticate the gospel as it was delivered by the apostles. And therefore, because we now have the gospel, those signs are no longer needed. It makes sense, doesn't it? But there are a few problems with that. And I'd like us to look at some of the lists of gifts in the Bible. So turn to 1 Corinthians 12 which we might actually get to today, or we might not. But in 1 Corinthians 12, we've been going through this, this list of giftings, haven't we? And if you'd look at verse 8, we read that to one Christian is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And then it goes on through that list. But turn to verse 28 now of chapter 12. It should be on the same page for you. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, help, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Also, please turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. Paul again writes, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, and the one who teaches in his teaching, etc., As we looked through those lists of gifts, did you see a little heading or a description saying, these are sign gifts and these ones are not sign gifts? You didn't. And that's because the Bible, when it lists gifts of the Holy Spirit, does not differentiate between some that are overtly supernatural and some that are not. So prophecy is listed next to helping, you know, or healing is listed in the same context as mercy. In other words, they're one package. It's not like there's a sort of one group here, one group here. They're all working to the Holy Spirit. What are the reasons that God gives these gifts to the church? What have we learned that the reasons for them are? building up of the body of Christ. And then the other one that we've sort of mentioned is what? To point people to Jesus. Excuse me. So my question is, does the body of Christ still need to be built up? Yes. Do people still need to be pointed to Jesus? Yes. 
Now, to be fair, one of the purposes of miraculous gifts is to be a sign, isn't it? But that's not the only purpose for these gifts. And so to say, because we don't need a sign to authenticate the Bible, we don't need these gifts, isn't a good reason, because that's not the only reason that they are given. Now, I know this is a bit technical, but for some of us, it's important, so we'll continue. Um, Those who hold to this view on the screen have a high view of the Word of God. Um, And as I mentioned, there's this worry that if, for example, God still has revelatory gifts, for example, prophecy, or maybe a word of knowledge, then what we're saying is what we have in the Bible isn't sufficient, and God's almost adding pages to the Bible if prophecy is still existent. Now, we'll look at that in a few weeks' time, but think about this. There were more prophecies given than what we have written in the Bible, and we know that, don't we? So, for example, Samuel in the Old Testament had a school of prophets. Do we have all the students' prophecies recorded in the Bible? No. Haggai's whole life was given over to prophecy. Now, we have got a book of Haggai, but there's three chapters. Were all of his prophecies recorded? No. There were prophets in the Corinthian church. Do we have any of their prophecies recorded? No. And so, therefore, not all prophecy is universally binding. That which we have in the Bible applies to everyone. But it's quite likely that a gift of prophecy would not be universal and so would not need to be put in the Bible, but could be specific. And we'll come back to that in a few weeks. Those who hold the the view on the screen have a right concern that the church might be misled. And that's fair, isn't it? You know, because we've all seen people trying to rip off other Christians You know, a a tele-evangelist who will wave his arms around or wave his jacket around and then say, give me your money. Now, we are right to be critical of that and to be discerning. And one of the reasons that is given is this, a desire that all things are done decently and in order. Because we can all think of that crazy church down the road. I'm not saying there is one down this road, but, you know, hypothetically, that crazy church where, you know, people are doing ridiculous things in the name of the Holy Spirit. And so we might want to rightly distance ourselves from that. But the problem isn't spiritual gifts. The problem is unspiritual people. And so my fear of the view on the screen, cessationism, is that Uh, It causes the body of the church to be amputated, some gifts to be cut off and say, we don't need you anymore. Now, I would rather have all my limbs and some chopped off, (laughs) and I want that for the church. If the gifts are given to edify the church and point people to Jesus, then if we're taking some away, that means that we might be less edified and less will be pointed to Jesus. And I believe also that if we say that God doesn't do miraculous things anymore, then we have a lower expectancy of God. But our God is infinite, isn't he? Right. I would ask you to give me five more minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Because I want to say what the flip side to what is on the screen is. And that is that all spiritual gifts continue to be available to the church and are necessary. But they're given however God wants them to be given. Now, there's some reasons for this, and I understand this a bit more like a Bible study, so thank you for bearing with me. I'll start with some reasons that are perhaps less convincing and then move on to some that are more convincing. Um, One is this, the testimony of church history. If certain gifts, you know, for example, healing or miracles ceased at the last apostle, then we wouldn't expect to have any trace of them in history since then, would we? However, we do. So, for example, 
Irenaeus, who died in the year 200, wrote a book called Against Heresies, which sounds good, doesn't it? But in, in that book, he said, we hear of many members of the church who have prophetic gifts and, by the Spirit, speak with all kinds of tongues and bring men's secret thoughts to light for their own good and expound the mysteries of God. Cyril of Jerusalem, who died in the year 386, in his catechetical lectures wrote, the Holy Spirit employs the tongue of one man for wisdom, the soul of another he enlightens by prophecy. To another he gives power to drive away devils. To another he gives to interpret the divine scriptures. Someone who recorded um, the history of the church in England, the Venerable Bede, has numerous accounts of miraculous gifts in the church. Prophecy was documented in the lives of John Knox and Robert Bruce, who were the 16th century Scottish reformers. Spiritual gifts, especially that of speaking in tongues, were common among the Moravians. That was that great missionary movement of the 1700s. John Wesley, who died in 1791, defended the ongoing operation, particularly the gift of tongues, beyond the time of the apostles. So that's one reason why I believe that all spiritual gifts are available to the church today. A more convincing reason is this. I believe that the plain reading of the scriptures has us believe that. So say, for example, Phil, God bless him, but he's on a, he's on a holiday um, in some tropical islands on a cruise, and then unfortunately the ship goes down, Phil's the only one left, and as he grabs onto something to float, he grabs onto a giant Bible, right, and he, and he floats onto an island. So he's, he's on a desert island just with a Bible, Phil reads the Bible, and he reads the Bible, because that's all he's got to do, and he reads the Bible. And, you know, I think if we just read the Scriptures, rather than perhaps being told otherwise, we would believe that God was still working these things today. Such a big chunk of the New Testament deals with miraculous things. Consider even 1 Corinthians. Why would Paul devote such an amount of ink to prophecy and tongues, if they're only going to last for a few more years. What would be the point? But he does. And consider some overt directions in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 14, 39, desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, we're told, do not despise prophecies. That's what we're told. Do you know, the correct response to abuse isn't disuse, but it's proper use. So when we see someone flailing a jacket around and kicking an old lady down and saying, be healed in Jesus' name, we might say that's an abuse, but the correct response to that isn't disuse, but proper use. That's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, not to say don't do it, but saying this is how it works. And finally, as I've said before, we still need edifying, don't we? We still long for people to be pointed to Jesus. And if the Lord wants to use miraculous ways to do that, amen. If he wants to use a piece of paper under a milk bottle <laughs> or something even more, you know, wow, then bring it on, Lord. We want to see people come to you. Now, for time's sake, I'm going to leave the gift of miracles till another week. But I'll read you again that verse from John chapter 14 and verse 12. Which says this. Jesus speaking, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. So to be upfront, I would like to encourage us as a church to be open to all that God wants to be done in the church. 
which I believe includes miraculous gifts. And we're going to do that with measure and with a high view of the scriptures. And we're going to seek to the body to be built up and for people to be pointed to Jesus, to the glory of God. And so, Lord, we thank you for your greatness. And, Lord, if there's things that I've said that have been wrong, that have been out of balance, um, forgive me and help us to discern, Lord. We, we don't want to listen to Matt. We want to listen to you. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I pray that as a church, we would be students of the Bible, but we'd also be practicing what we read. Lord, we do feel powerless. I feel powerless today. We long to see you working through us, even in miraculous ways. Not so that we can pat ourselves on the back thinking how great we are, but so that people would see and we would be reminded how great you are. So lead us, Lord. And we thank you for that greatest miracle that you work in our hearts through the new birth. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection of Christ that means that we can be risen to new life as well. Amen.